Our party is almost ready to enter the Betrayer's Rise, and we're going to prep for it today. So let's dig in. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. So our party just finished the Hythenos Estate encounter, and we are going to dig into Betrayer's Rise a little bit today. So timestamps, if you want to jump to that, are in the description below. First things first, let's talk about our characters. So we have Chosen, who is our bugbear barbarian. He is best friends with Jimmy. We've got Dimitri, our gnome fighter, who's passionate about everything. Iris, our halfling warlock, who was brainwashed by her parents to worship the Moonweaver. We have Jimmy, our sea elf druid, who is our friendly neighborhood nature. Think of the Boy Scouts. We have Melvin, a half elf bard, who is kind of hit and miss as far as being here. I think he hasn't been in a while. So we also have added a new player, Trixie, who is a human artificer wizard mercenary who is working odd jobs and we'll introduce her this session so that should be pretty fun our strong start so we're just going to jump right into things our party just got to the ready room at the end of last session where they're ready to report to Areldra what exactly happened with her father's estate and home our party also has a stone statue which has been following them and I did that in the last session link to the video where we talked about that above. We did that because one of our some of our players were gone and instead of having the statues attack I didn't want to TPK anybody so it just follows the magic item around and we'll have a real deal with that. She'll know the code words to get the guardian out of here. The second part of our strong start is we're going to be introducing our new player. So Trixie is our human artificer slash wizard who is the bodyguard of sorts for Ereldra. So she went with Ereldra to go help find the relic. She's been working with the Hythenos family. Ereldra is going to ask the party if Trixie can come along with them into the Betrayer's Rise and kind of report back their findings because her father has been researching so much the Betrayer's Rise. She's Any info she can get, she's for. And then we'll have her join the party from there. So scenes. We will have the ready room, obviously. So this is the, the only inn in Bazozan. We'll have some talking going on there with Ereldra reporting back and then introducing Trixie. Then I expect the party will want to go talk to Tascan Thalus so that they can go straight into Betrayer's Rise. That's my expectation for today. However, I'm also, we prepped for the rest of the chapter a few sessions ago. So I've got that information I can go look at if I need to, if they want to go somewhere else and do a few other things before they go into Betrayer's Rise. So I've got the link for the Gatehold Barracks, which is where Tascan Thalus will be. So I can just jump there if I need to, and we can have some fun. There's a few things that the party can do and interact with the soldiers there. The next is Betrayer's Rise. And honestly, I think that's where my party's going to head as soon as they can. So let's go ahead and click on this. All right. So here's our Betrayer's Rise location in our campaign database for our Notion notebook. So you can see here's the player's version. I'll just dump that into Owlbear Rodeo and I'll put some fog of war so that we can hide rooms as we and unhide them as we find them. This is the DM version. And then I've got some features. This is just the overall features that the book provides so we can see that everything's pretty much blackstone the ceilings are 50 foot in the rooms and 20 foot in the hallways everything is dark and then again a note that the, the halls shift depending on who's in the betrayers rise so down here i've got a key for each of the rooms i've got some quick notes for each room so that i have a quick reference to things that are the most important for each room so we've got religion checks or ability checks and saving throws in green i've got the monsters in red uh, here's the different rooms in orange and then anything I want to read aloud, I've got in blue, I've got extra information in purple. And then this pink here is the key to solving one of the riddles. So this is all quick reference for me. I'll have the book open as well so that I can read some of the read aloud text. But if I have a quick question or to make sure I don't miss anything, I've got these here and hopefully we don't miss anything. So let's open up the book or open up the map and talk about each of the locations. All right. So our first room here, this is the entrance. First things first is there is an encounter where they face two gloom stalkers before they get into the actual dungeon itself. And after they do that, the book tells them to level up. So we're going to have our party level up to level six. I feel like it's okay. We had a pretty decent dungeon dive of sorts with the Hythenos estate and we'll move on from there. So in the first area, we've got just the entrance room. There's a big giant hole that goes down into this area over here. And the doors only open if you have the Jewel of Three Prayers and my party does. I highly recommend that you find a way to get your party to have the Jewel before you get here. I think there's ways to work around it, but it's easier if they've got it. Next is the Hall of Holes. So this whole area, there's just holes that are like whispering things. 
there's some things that the party can see on the walls, some murals and things, and then they get into this area, which has, I don't know, we can't zoom in anymore, but there is a bunch of different alcoves. So there's a hidden door here, and this one's kind of caved in that the party can kind of look at. You can dig through this. I think it takes a little while to dig through this area, but you can do it. And in this northwest little alcove, there's a secret hidden door. If my party speaks Abyssal, and I think Jimmy speaks Abyssal, it says, to me, touch your hand, to me, relinquish hope, to you, accept death to you invite hollowness. So they can, there's a bunch of different checks that they can do in order to get through and if they're willing to die, essentially they can make it through. It's only a one way door and they can get this direction. So every single member of the party has to do that. And then up here in the north, there's a table with a skull vase. You can make some checks and things to see how you can get through that. If they do everything right, I think the door slides open. There's a door and you can go through the rest of this. Over here in R5, there's a couple of different statues of Torog the Crawling King and a couple of other checks that they can make. Uh, there is a bladed corridor that they go through here and it kind of tilts back and forth as they go. They have to make some checks. And the cool thing with this is if you go over here, there's a little hidden room over here that has some blood vials. So in order to get through here, you have to fill this, I can't remember if it's a crystal or something at the end of the hallway. And one way you can do that is to use some of the crystal vials. The other way is by getting poked by all these little daggers and eventually you fill up this. I think you have to take 70 hit points or something like that from your party in order to open this door. So that's kind of tricky and fun. We'll see how that goes. One thing also to note, I'm gonna have Tascan Thalys tell my party that this place has been known to do some damage to people, right? I've already expressed that before, that this is a dangerous place, but I'm gonna mention that people have come back cursed, dead, dying, so be on your lookout. If they go this way and manage to get through the secret door and head this way down the stairway, we can head into this area. But if not, they can dig out this area and there's some driders, there are some giant spiders that they can fight. And also in this area is a secret room where they can find some information. I think there's books and things. There might be a couple other little treasure items as well. But I'm going to have, make sure that this breaks open during the fight and my party is going to be able to find a booklet that has information on the Betrayer Gods. So I've put together a little PDF that just has the information straight from the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. So it has a description of each of the Betrayer Gods. It has a picture of their symbol, has their commandments and things like that. Because for this next riddle in the next room, they're gonna need to know that information. And I, I, I'm I, going to assume that they all don't know that. My players don't know that. The characters might have some inclination, but I think having that physical thing in front of them, I'm gonna print it off. And I'll have a link for that in the description below. If you're interested in that, you can print that off or send it to your players, whatever. Digitally, that's fine too. So it should help them with the next area. So in this next area, there are a few dancing flames that come to light. If they get too close or if they do things wrong, they can attack. Uh, but they have to solve this puzzle and you have to touch the symbols of the deities in the correct order. And I think that order is written in pink in my notes so that I don't forget. But you first have to touch the Lulth symbol, then the uh, Grumsh symbol, then the symbol for Thera's Dune, and then the symbol for Torog. And then when you all do all of that, it opens up the pathway to go to this area. Inside R10 here is basically just a giant hallway with a hole at the end. And from the hole, you can jump down to R12. So the distance down to here is 100 feet. The book mentions that they can try and jump onto this first little hand statue, which is about a 30 foot drop, and then they can attempt to climb down from there. Inside of R12, this is a very important room for Betrayer's Rise because this little area here leads down to the prayer site of Evander. The whole reason that a party is coming to Betrayer's Rise. There's this little statue of this guy who's in chains and inside of his chest there's iron doors that can be opened and the only way to open them is to destroy these pustules that are on one of each of the hands. I think it takes some damage once you destroy it one side of the triangle lights up destroy all three and all three sides of the triangle light up and the doors are open. If they decide, if the party decides not to go straight for the prayer site and go in through the doors, they can explore a little bit more. Over here is a maze that's pretty tricky actually. So the party is initially provided with a choice. You can choose to go down a path that's lit by violet flames, a path that's lit by red flames, or a path that's in complete darkness. They choose one, go for a little bit, and then they're provided the same three choices. You do this three times and then if they don't choose the darkness all three times, they start back where they began and they have to pick the darkness every time. And you can provide them with some hints, with some hit, 
checks to let them know that one of the commandments of Torog is to seek and exalt places where no light touches. And that should hopefully let them know that they should pick the darkness all three times and then they can make it through. Um, they also, I think, take some exhaustion if they don't if they fail a save and don't pick the darkness three times. So this can get pretty brutal pretty fast. Uh, if you make it through, you can get over here to this little area. It's worth mentioning if the party tries to go this way, they can hear the stone slab rise so they can't actually enter this way. They have to come from this way. And in here, there are some orc war priests that have been, or there were Aurora and Watch soldiers have been converted and they say a little prayer as soon as the prayer starts this blood pool starts to expand and can do some damage to your party these little slabs come up and there's a little fight that will happen once the they die then the blood stops and can goes back down you can also then go from there over to this giant rift i think it's like a thousand feet down and you can climb down and find some bodies and there's a little bit of loot as well as the uh rift to the abyss which is over this way i think so that's pretty much everything here and then you go down to the prayer site of evandra through this tunnel up here once they climb down and place the jewel on the altar they have another vision about elixian and when they wake up they run into the rival party showing up as well as Aloysia and my party is pretty friendly with the rivals so probably Aloysia is going to just take off and leave some tablets for them teleport themselves to Ankarel but we'll see how that plays out I expect my party will not get through all of this in one session we run three hour sessions okay back to our session prep all right some secrets and clues these are things I like to reveal to the party as they go about and it can be given to them from anyone uh, the layout of the betrayer's rise is different for every group who enters the chaotic magic of the abyss warps the configuration to stymie explorers and baffle for cartographers. Adventurers, relic hunters, and researchers have all entered Betrayer's Rise and come back cursed, injured, and dead. So be careful. Again, I, this will probably all be said by Tascan Thales, but we'll see. If they don't happen to talk to him, someone else can. This is just uh, talking about the Battle of the Barb Fields, which they can find a depiction of in Betrayer's Rise. It is a battle in the Calamity, which devotees of the Prime Deities broke through the garrison at Betrayer's Rise and reached the Wall of Gordranus. When they get through the vision, they have the opportunity to ask Elixian a few questions. Here's what the book provides. I have this in here. I'm not going to read through this now, but they can ask some questions and he can give them the answers here. Quests, these are just from my chapter three overall view. This is just in case they decide they don't want to go straight into Betrayer's Rise. I have these in front of me and where they can find them. And then NPCs, we've got a list of everybody here that they may or may not run into as they go throughout their session. And then as standard for me, these are just the monsters that they will face when they go to Betrayer's Rise. I've got some plans for how they'll go based on Matthew Colville's action-oriented monsters, which is just a fantastic video. None of these are boss fights, so I'm not like putting a ton of time into them. And then I've got stat blocks snipped for each monster. So there's gibbering mouthers, flame skulls, uh, there's some driders, giant spiders, uh, there's dancing flames, there's orc war chiefs, there's a rock potentially, and then I've got some treasure down here. So we've got a cloak of protection that can be found in a cracked drift globe. These are found at the bottom of the rift in Betrayer's Rise, and then I'm gonna add a magic item at the Avandra's prayer site. I probably don't have to worry about it for this session because I don't think they'll make it all the way through, but I want to give each player, aside from our war Iris who has the Jewel of Three Prayers, I want to give them something that's exciting at this point. I feel like they should have a couple more magic items than they do, and my party seems to be beelining it for the end, so they're missing some of the loot as they go. So I'm going to give them each something that I think they will enjoy, and that is pretty much it for my session prep for Betrayer's Rise. I'm really excited to see how this goes. It'll be fun to see how they do in a proper dungeon with traps and with riddles and monster battles. I think it should be a lot of fun. So that's pretty much it. Thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate it, and we'll catch you in the next one.